you might be wondering why it looks like this computer's already been worked on. Or you may be wondering why the computer's already been taken apart. You may not even know what computer this is. All of this stems from the fact that this is the first Akabakuku video. I had been encouraged by Jiraga1 to try making videos on my own channel after working with him on several of his own. I eventually started making a list of those ideas and giving them project numbers. Now the first couple of projects I didn't really get off the ground with because they weren't terribly well thought out. So I eventually went with something I already had working and made a video on my Commodore PET keyboard software for the Teensy. After I did that video I had a better idea of how I wanted to make videos. I wasn't that big of a fan of making videos about things that were already finished, but I did like the idea of something that I'd worked on and maybe repairing something. So I started to record me working on this IBM 5150, and it was a very difficult process. I didn't quite know how I was going to be doing audio and had mistakenly recorded the audio separately on my computer and messed up my camera's audio too bad to be usable. In addition, the repair ended up being somewhat ambiguous, and I didn't know what parts I would need, even as I got closer. And this is what led me to get the ESR meter that I subsequently fried and repaired in another video. But at this point, I think I have everything I could possibly need to be able to finally move on with this project. But before we do that, it's time to take a huge step back to the first footage I ever recorded for actually making an Akbakuku video. This is an IBM... 5150, complete with dual full height five and a quarter inch floppy drives, CGA graphics card, and a whopping 256 kilobytes of RAM, making for one excellent personal computer. Now, you are likely hearing a problem that this thing has. Somewhere inside of that computer, something is making a horrific whining noise, and that must be resolved. So, today, we're going to be taking a look inside the IBM 5150. Now, unfortunately, that's not the only problem. Those of you who are familiar with full-height 5 and a quarter drives will notice that the latch is missing on drive 1 here. I have all of the parts. There has just been a failure with how the mechanism works. The latch on a 5 and a quarter inch drive uses two pins that hold on to the carrier for the clamp. On drive B, those pins broke. I came up with a fairly simple solution to repair the latch on my IBM drive. The latch is held in place with this plastic clip. The pins slide in through these holes. I've gone ahead and repaired this with super glue and have a piece of spring steel I cut from a binder clip that threads through the holes. This will not fall out because it is guided inside of the drive and we'll hold that in place perfectly. If the 256K of RAM didn't give it away, this is a late model 5150. So it has five screws instead of the original two. Now the front will slide forward. get caught, you'll want to tilt it back and lift it up. And we're in. The back side of the drive mechanics can be seen here. Undo these two screws I had returned. Remove the ejection removal guard. And try out the repair. You'll need to put the clip in first. Feed through the clasps. There we go. Okay, now while holding it down, we'll return the guard and screw everything back in place. There's one. And two. Now, the drive should stay. Um. Well, 
Well, the clamp fix immediately broke. Super glue was not strong enough. Uh, <laughs> I will be looking for a replacement solution. Well, broken floppy drive or not, we still need to resolve the whine. Now, it sounds like it's coming from the PC speaker, but most likely it is actually the power supply. So I will be inspecting that. Let me go ahead and fire it up here. And let's see where it happens. So, I'm first going to attempt unplugging the PC speaker. And it stops. So, drive power turns off the PC speaker. That's interesting. Oh, I didn't know the diagnostics was a boot disk. Oh, well, you know. Now, the PC speaker connection is right here, and once it is unplugged, the noise stops. Now, I'm wondering if there's some kind of ground bounce going on uh, due to an ailing power supply, and I'm not really sure. I think it's time to break out the oscilloscope and start checking some voltages. So here I'm connected to chassis ground and the positive input on the PC speaker connector. And I'm at uh, 0.5 milliseconds per division. And we can see that every three divisions we have five peaks. So we're looking at 3.3 uh, kilohertz about. Uh, that is the frequency that we're getting out of our PC speaker. So now it's time to measure uh, the positive voltage rail against ground and see if we see a similar frequency there. My next step is going to be to remove the power supply and check all of the voltages coming directly out of it. And here we are, the 5150 power supply. Okay, so I've got my power supply pulled out, and I've got my multimeter here. So go ahead and start checking the uh, voltage rails here. Probably safe to assume this will power on. It did not. So it must do some kind of check for the computer. Now that we know that the PC speaker is actually the culprit, I am taking a measurement of the negative side of the PC speaker, which is the drive side, and we can see that it is a flat line. We're not getting any signal. If I go ahead and restart the computer, we should see this change as it beeps on startup. All right, the disk drive is accessing, soaking power from the power supply, and it quieted it down. So we can tell that this is using the same power, uh, the same voltage that the disk drive is using, which will be the 5 or the 12 volt rail. So we need to check uh, both of those coming out of the power supply to determine which one is doing this. And here's where I stop recording more footage. There is actually a little bit more where I take apart the power supply and try and look at the capacitors on it and realize that my Fluke 287 is very underwhelmingly capable when it comes to measuring capacitors. So you might be thinking, well, haha, now it's time to go ahead and recap the power supply and move on. But it isn't quite that simple. At some point between then and now, my 5150's power supply has completely failed. Now here's where it gets even a little more confusing. I managed to get another 5150 compatible power supply. This is actually meant for a knockoff 5160, but it fits in the case. And if I put that in there, the computer works fine. And if we take a look at this yet again different monochrome monitor that's not IBM brand, we can see the computer is in fact working. The speaker's no longer making that 3.3 kilohertz sound, but it is working. So it seems like putting in that new power supply has fixed the computer. 
It now turns on and works, and it no longer makes the whining sound. But I believe we've merely fixed the symptom, not the problem. And in addition, while that has fixed this computer, it doesn't help my other 5150. I got this second 5150 and monitor off of Craigslist as a non-functioning unit. I had a feeling I could make it work because the 5153 is CGA and it was fitted with a monochrome card. Now I believe that the only problem was the CGA monitor being incompatible with the monochrome card, which they are, but it turns out this power supply is dead as well. There's some you don't see anymore, an AMD brand chip with an Intel produced architecture. And after putting the CGA card from my first 5150 into this one, and putting the MDA card from this one into the other, as you've probably figured out by now, we can see that this computer does work with the other power supply I have. However, it does refuse to boot from any floppy disks right now, but that's a separate problem. Alright, now that was all kind of a lot pretty quick after the first part of the video, so let me recap everything I have here right now. My original 5150 with a good floppy drive and a physically bad floppy drive, my additional 5150, which has a likely good floppy drive and an electrically faulty floppy drive, meaning I have two broken floppy drives and two working ones, or maybe three working floppy drives, as I have this additional one now as well, a slightly more correct MDA monitor than the green screen one I was previously using that won't actually work with the MDA card, a 100% correct 5153 CGA monitor, a single keyboard, the two original failed power supplies, the new clone replacement power supply that works, an MDA card, and a CGA card. And those are all the basic parts that I have to work with here right now. Okay, well I also got the 5152 printer. And I was given this extra motherboard with a V20-8088 in it. And that's it, aside from some other ISA cards that wouldn't have come with the computer. So now you're up to speed on all the 5150 stuff I've been getting since I originally started this project. It's changed quite a lot. But for this video, we're just going to focus on the original 5150 I got with the monochrome card and the MDA monitor. Now back to why it took me so long to make this video and why I'm not saying the power supply being replaced is the ultimate solution. This is minus0degrees.net, run by Ray, who frequents the vintage computer forums. On this site, there is a very useful minimum diagnostic configuration to help you troubleshoot problems with your 5150. So I went through the diagnostics and came to the determination that I should check the resistance of the tantalum capacitors on this. Now if we look elsewhere on minus zero degrees, we can find a list of other 5150s and 5160s and 5170s that have had problems that have been resolved on the vintage computer forms, and a staggering number of them have had problems with the tantalum capacitors. So naturally I assumed, well, the capacitors must have gone bad on my board, caused the power supply to be overloaded, and then eventually killed it as it kept going. And here's the first of the two measurements that I took of this that kind of put me in a difficult position with this computer. One of the final steps in diagnosing bad tantalum capacitors is doing a resistance test across the 5V and minus 5V rails. This isn't a totally accurate way of doing this test, which is why the nominal range is between 200 and 1300 ohms. If you have a dead short, that's a little bit easier to determine if the capacitor has failed, but I don't. Mine is 170 ohms, which is lower than 200, but I would still consider that around 200 when the range is 200 to 1300. And here is the measurement of my minus 5 volt. Now, there isn't a nominal range for this, it's just anecdotal that it's such a high resistance typically that it can't be measured, except that I'm pretty solidly measuring 50 kilo ohms there. But it goes on to say that if you measure zero or a few ohms, there is a short. And that is neither zero nor a few ohms. So after learning that, I was left with two choices. This is when the power supply was still working for me. I could either assume that the power supply was failing due to age and try and replace the capacitors in that, or I could try and replace the capacitors on the motherboard. In the end, the power supply ended up failing just while sitting on a shelf, because I didn't do anything with it. And then it took me several months to be able to get the next power supply that would actually continue to work. But at that point, I was concerned about putting it in the computer. So the only reasonable option became replacing the capacitors. And there we have it, the 5150 motherboard. 
I've been building this up in my head for so long that this feels more momentous than it should. Looks like an AMD chip snuck into this one as well. Now I am going to replace all of these as a matter of course, because I don't want to have this problem again later if another one of these goes bad. But I want to know which one caused the actual problem, so I'm going to measure every single one of these as I take them out, and note the reference designators for whichever ones are out of spec. I didn't notice this when I was just pointing these out earlier. The ref des is the same for every capacitor everywhere on the circuit board. They're all C7 for the three pin ones. So the reference designators are equivalent to a part number on here. So I guess if I'm going to correlate which ones failed, I'm going to need to know the physical location of it, not just the ref des, because they all have the same ref des. Well, anyway, you slice it, it's time for me to finally do this, so let's get started. Ah, screw it, I was going to get all fancy with this, but instead I'll just use my big fat tip that can hit all three pads at once. One down. Alright, now that I have one of the old capacitors out, let me show you how I'm going to fail test these. Since the tantalum capacitors just fail short, I don't really need to use my ESR meter for this, as I can just do a standard resistance measurement test. So a new capacitor put into this test will start to charge up, and it will seem like it has a resistance as it pulls current, but eventually the capacitor will be fully charged, and it will read overload. Now I'll go ahead and do the same test for the capacitor I just removed. That one looks like it's probably fine, but we'll still be replacing it anyway. Since the new capacitors are just two pin devices, we will be putting the long lead, which will be the anode, into the center, and the cathode on the other side. That one's good to go. On to the next one. That cap charges fully, just as expected. That one seems good as well. I do believe I've just found my first bad capacitor. We go ahead and do the charge test. It looks like it's charging normally. But we can see that the resistance stays. It doesn't just get to around 1 mega ohm and then go to overload. Just for curiosity's sake, let's compare this one that's obviously bad to one that hasn't tested bad on an ESR meter. Okay, here I have one of the new capacitors hooked up to my ESR meter, and I have the data sheet for this capacitor up on my phone here. So, the capacitor is supposed to be measured at 100 kilohertz, and we can see this is a 16 volt capacitor, actually, um, and it is the uh, 10 microfarad uh, capacity. So that would be this one right here. This should have a max ESR, okay, because that's what that uh, is measuring, of 3.2 ohms, and we're getting 0 0.62. So that's obviously within the max, um, but we're also not reading 10 microfarads. So interesting. If we change the frequency to, I think we were able to get, I was able to get away with 1 hertz, 1000 hertz, yeah. We'll get about 1 ohm on there. Now, if we throw a 3-pin cap, let's put a good one on there, and measure that, we'll see 10 microfarads and actually a lower ESR value. Now, I do have an equivalent data sheet for this one. And we can see it should also be 100 kilohertz. Basically, all of the solid capacitors are 100 kilohertz. Um, it would be the 16 volt. It would be the 10 microfarad. So it should still be 3.2 ohms max ESR. And we're still seeing significantly lower than that. And if I set it to 100 kilohertz, we'll see a number about the same. Now, putting in the measured bad on 
a pure DC resistance test capacitor, the ESR reading isn't very different at all. Matter of fact, I wouldn't be able to distinguish those. So the DC resistance test is really the only way we're going to see a difference here. Now, I'll be um, a bit honest here and say that I don't really fully understand how this ESR meter works, and I was even trying to look up the manual for this thing, because it's a bit confusing, and this doesn't seem like this should be how this goes. I would think that I would see a measurable difference between the capacitors, so perhaps I'm doing something wrong here, but I, I think this is just a limitation of measuring these types of solid capacitors. Well, I've gone through and double-checked the polarity on all these, so it's ready to be snipped. And after all that work of replacing all those capacitors, my new value is... exactly the same. None of my capacitors had failed short completely, so this isn't that surprising now that I've taken them all out and measured them. But at least now I know that the ones that are on there are going to be good for a lot longer. The negative 5 volt rail tells the exact same story. Well, now that we've recapped the motherboard, we know that's not the problem. However, the add-in cards still have capacitors on those rails, and they're the same kind of three-legged capacitors. So we should check those by sticking them in one at a time. So we're at 168 right now, and if I put the CGA card in, we see 140, actually that's the MDA card, 140. And putting in the floppy card, 33! Yeah, that's not good. That's significantly low. So we'll go ahead and look at recapping the floppy controller. So the floppy controller only has two of the three pinned capacitors on it, there and there, and they are the same 10 microfarad. It has a lot of these ones that I believe are 47 nanofarads. So there is the possibility one of those could be bad. Um, I don't have a 47 nanofarad capacitor on hand. I have 150s, and I have hundreds, and I could have the hundreds, I guess, um, and try and get a replacement going, but that's eh, not super great. So hopefully the problem's not one of those. So I'll just go ahead and replace these two and see how that goes. All right, the first one off measures as... 2.7 mega ohms. So that one's probably not bad, based on how the other ones responded. That one looks good. That's not good. Unfortunately, even with those capacitors out, it still reads as 33 ohms. So I'm going to have to take a look at all the other ones on there. All right, so I swapped the two three pin capacitors and it read the same. So I pulled out one of the smaller capacitors, and now when I put it in, it reads 33 ohms. That's weird, because it just read 39 for me. Let me fully seat it. Still reads 33 ohms, but I decided it was worth grabbing the other floppy control card and sticking it in, and it also reads 33 ohms. So I'm thinking that's not a problem, but that still seems kind of low, like there's something not quite right going on there. I'm still not thrilled with 33 ohms, but at least I have corroborating evidence that that's how it should act. It just it feels really low. Well, I tried looking around online, but I wasn't able to find any information on how these cards should read in there. So I'm just going to have to go ahead and assume that the power supply was the only problem at this point. I was really hoping I could find a capacitor and point a finger at it as being the cause of my problems. But it's starting to seem like it's most likely bad caps in the power supplies. While this computer's still open, I may as well swap out the floppy drive with the bad latch for the one that doesn't, and then I can work on 3D printing something for this one now, and see if I can get it working again. Oh, that's right. My replacement floppy drive is not complete. Um, alright. I guess I'll just be better off transferring the plastic bits. Ah, there we go. New drive clip latch. New drive latch, that's it. Ah, finally. Two working drives. Well, that pretty much wraps everything up for the 5150. Um, it's now a functional working computer. 
which is awesome because I haven't had one of these working yet. Now, this isn't totally perfect. Um, I am going to leave this 5150 configured as a monochrome computer. I figure with two floppy drives and MDA, it represents the low end of 5150s fairly well. Well, this isn't a 5151 monitor, it is a pretty good imitation, and I like the amber. Unfortunately, it's got some problems going on where it needs all the brightness, and it just is barely visible, even with Max. So I'll probably have to do some repairs to this monitor. Which brings me to the other computer, which will become the CGA computer. I'm definitely going to be coming back to that one and repairing it. I'm going to have to crack open the power supplies and get a cap order for those so I can get two working power supplies in addition to the one that's in this one now. And I'm probably going to see if I can find a hard drive bay in here and maybe get a hold of an XT to IDE adapter. That way I can put a hard drive in the other one and have it be a reasonably modern one that won't die on me. But for now I'm going to enjoy this computer, which unfortunately the only software I have that will even attempt to run is this copy of Jeopardy. And it doesn't actually play, it just plays the music when you first try and run it. It doesn't have any capability of writing to the MDA graphics card, so it just plays the music. I hope you guys have enjoyed this rather complicated video for me. This is one of the earlier videos that I had started working on. There are a few others, and they'll trickle out eventually. But this is the first video I tried to make for this channel, so it's nice to finally have it resolved. Hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you later. Mm-hmm.